Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Language. I am Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur and we are now in the seventh week of this course. We have talked about various aspects of language use, production, comprehension, sentence processing and all of that by now. Uh, this week I have kind of uh, taken a path wherein I will sort of uh, you know help you revise all what we have learned and in that revision we will also try and add some more information as to each of these processes that we have learned already about where in the brain they might be occurring. This is uh, going to be an account of say for example if you are talking about language production what are the areas of the brain involved in language production but I will have to already revise some of uh, what you already know. So, a lot of this week, a lot of this chapter will actually come as a revision of what uh, you have already done, but what we, will going, uh, what we will be adding to that is basically this knowledge of which areas of the brain are basically helping us accomplish those mental tasks. So, with that background, let us try and move uh, further uh, and also uh, uh, just one last thing to add is that also I will be talking uh, to you about say for example, I will show you which specific areas, we will not really have, we do not really have so many figures, but I will try and give you an idea, a, a basic sense of how the brain is organized and so on. So, let us uh, move uh, with this without you know wasting our time, today we are going to uh, talk about neural, the neural basis of word meaning. If you remember on the chapter on word processing, uh, in towards the end of the chapter we did talk about the fact that how word meanings might be organized. Let us kind of look at that a little bit more and a little bit uh, you know we do a little bit of a revision and then we see which areas of the brain are helping us do that job. Now preface, uh, basically so cognitive neuroscience, uh, part of what I am going to do today is uh, comes under what is broadly called cognitive neuroscience. Cognitive neuroscience basically or very loosely uh, you know refers to the science that establishes the neural basis of cognitive functions. Suppose uh, we uh, you know we have talked about, sorry we have talked about so many cognitive functions in this course and uh, some of the others. The idea is that what each of the mental function or uh, you know how each of the mental function is organized in the brain. These are some of the questions that are asked in cognitive neuroscience. The basic idea is that any of the mental functions that we talk about are uh, either done by say for example in, in a localized uh, fashion uh, done by specific areas of the brain or uh, in a distributed sense are accomplished by a network of areas in the brain. You know say for example, uh, if you remember the word processing chapter, we said that okay, uh, is the information about uh, animate objects stored in this particular part of the brain or is it stored in a distributed sense, that, that kind of a thing. Or say for example, in language production, uh, you know, uh, is the broca's area the only area that is responsible for production of language and if that broca's area is damaged, no production is possible or that the broca's area is a very prominent part of a network of areas that help you produce language. So, that kind of question is asked. So, in this chapter basically we will be trying uh, you know to establish that kind of uh, a scenario as to we will again revisit some of the mental uh, functions with respect to language that we have talked about and we will see which parts of the brain are involved in doing that. Now, coming to words and the representation of word meanings. Some of the questions that can be asked uh, is in terms of say for example, for words uh, there are two modalities uh, that we can talk about. First is the input modality uh, that is comprehension of words and the second is output modality that is the production of words. So, what basically uh, you know uh, can be asked say for example, is how does the brain deal with the various kinds of inputs uh, that come uh, you know uh, uh, to us and derive meaning. Say for example, you read a word or you hear a word, uh, both ways uh, uh, the same word might be coming through different routes. Eventually the understanding of both words will be common, say for example, either I read the word apple or you uh, say apple and I hear the word apple, the uh, end point is the concept of apple that I should reach. How is the brain differentiating between these two processes? How is the brain differentiating between the kinds of inputs that are coming in? So, we will talk about that a little bit. And the second question is, suppose you have to uh, produce the output, say for example, is it the same set of processes that you will take in order to write a word and speak a word as well. 
So that is also a part of the question that we will look at or we will try and answer. Now, one of the basic concepts when you talk about words uh, with respect to, especially with respect to, you know, psycholinguistics is that words are organized in the brain in a particular fashion. One of the most common uh, concepts that you will come across when you are reading any psycholinguistics is this word called mental lexicon. And the mental lexicon is roughly, uh, it's, it's almost like a mental dictionary and this mental dictionary uh, stores different kinds of information about the word in question. Suppose say for example there is this word apple and you know apple or player or uh, you know mango or say for example you know sleep, sleeping, eat, eating, all those kinds of words. All of these words will be stored in this mental dictionary and the mental dictionary in addition to uh, you know what is the information that this mental dictionary have uh, about these words. So the mental dictionary or the mental lexicon let us call it that the mental lexicon basically stores information about the semantics that is what the word means associative and sense uh, based meanings and also say for example syntactic information what are the various versions of this word uh, where are each of these versions appropriately used uh, and what are these uh, you know words associated with all of that kind of so semantic and syntactic information and also information about word form what is the correct spelling of this word with respect to writing versus what is the correct spelling of this word in terms of sound and sometimes and these uh, uh, representations might be related to each other and uh, the idea is that they are also convertible uh, into each other say for example if you have if you are reading the spelling of the word reading so to speak uh, you can from reading uh, you know dis uh, reading that spelling uh, you know deciphering the visual symbol go to the sound based representation and from there on to the meaning of the word reading okay so there have been uh, debates about these things the uh, stuff that i'm talking about there have been debates about these things as to whether uh, there is one lexicon that uh, one unified mental dictionary one unified lexical store uh, that suffices for both production and understanding production and comprehension or say for example there might be different input and output lexicon so comprehension is a different set of processes and production is a different set of processes so is it possible that uh, say for example the output lexicon uh, or the lexicon that uh, you know draw or say for example the store that uh, reading and uh, uh, sorry the uh, store that uh, speaking and writing process uh, derive on is different versus the store that connects to uh, meaning when you are uh, you know listening to something or reading something are different. So this debate is, has been around. Uh, other kind of debate that has also been around is uh, whether orthographical or phonological word forms are stored together or they are stored separately because the uh, form or the representation is different. Uh, an orthographical representation is in form of visual symbols whereas a phonological representation is in form of sounds. Given the fact that they are uh, interconvertible is also a very interesting uh, thing and we have to kind of uh, also at some point look at the processes that are involved in, convert, uh, in converting the written to the sound and the sound to the written form. That is also a very interesting question that we can ask. Now uh, having said that, let us try and see where does it all begin, where does uh, uh, you know the processing of a word begin. Now, uh, irrespective of the fact whether you are listening to a particular word or you are reading a particular word, uh, the first instance uh, of the word in, uh, you know, input uh, will need to uh, undergo some kind of perceptual analysis. Now, what is this perceptual analysis? We have talked about that, I am just kind of you know, repeating all of this information. The perceptual analysis in terms of uh, you know when you are reading is the visual analysis of the orthographic symbol in or and you have to link those symbols together in order to come to you know some sound based representation and from that sound you have to again uh, concatenate those sound based representation to form the entire spelling of the word and then that goes to meaning and so on. When you are listening to a particular word. Uh, you have to say for example if you remember those uh, you know captain and uh, you know uh, that example then uh, captain and captive you have to be sure of what is the word that has been said if you remember the cohort model uh, you are uh, listening to something as soon as you listen uh, arrive at the onset so many candidates are uh, you know active at that point from that point 
uh, wherein uh, the onset is just started and so many uh, candidates are there to the point that you finally uh, recognize this word is also a very important thing. So initial perceptual analysis is necessary uh, whether you are listening a word or you are reading a word. Now once the perceptual analysis is done and you have reached sort of to the form of the input okay this is what the spelling is or this is what the sound is like then basically what you do is you match this form the input form to the form that is already stored you know the knowledge the mental lexicon wherein you know about these words you cannot lexically access or you cannot you know, look for a word in your uh, understanding that you have never read okay i mean you can do some other processes there but uh, the processes that uh, come after you've generated a sort of a output of perceptual analysis is a bunch of uh, two or three processes and that is how and uh, this is how they have been put up so the first process that works on uh, the perceptual and output of the perceptual analysis system is the process of lexical access. You use this form and you match it with the form that you already store in the head and you kind of depending on the match you will activate one or more uh, candidates and that is basically called lexical access. So the mental process where word form representations match uh, are matched with the perceptual analysis of the input and resulting uh, this matching procedure uh, the thing that most matches is activated that is lexical access. Now what happens is in lexical access again you might feel that I am repeating again what happens is lexical uh, uh, access is that there might be various uh, word forms that you know of that are matching the incoming input to various degrees. On the basis of the various degrees of match multiple candidates often get activated. Thereon comes the second process which is the process of lexical selection. So you have kind of uh, uh, you know activated let us say three very close word forms and then you have to kind of you know select which of the one is the most matching one. So the lexical representation that best, best matches the input word will then be selected. So that is the lexical selection. So two processes lexical access, lexical selection. What is the third one? The third one is called lexical integration. What is lexical integration? Suppose you have uh, said that okay this is the one that uh, I am selecting or suppose I am not very sure of whether bat is the cricket instrument or the bird uh, or whether uh, you know bank is the financial institution or uh, you know the side of the river. Therein comes the importance of things like lexical integration. So the identified words are now supposed to be integrated with the whole utterance and uh, in terms of the sentence and in terms of the larger uh, context of the discourse and that is where the fit is evaluated. Suppose you want to go with the meaning uh, financial institution of the word bank, uh, it should fit in with the larger discourse. Suppose this, it's, uh, somebody said you know I planted the tree by the bank. Now here even if say for example you know the broadly the most frequent meaning is the financial institution and sort and that uh, you know through perceptual analysis and lexical selection both are I mean it is the same thing. So, uh, uh, which meaning you have to take is going to be dependent on how well that particular meaning gets integrated with the rest of the discourse that will help you decide okay. So uh, broadly speaking perceptual analysis, lexical access, lexical selection and lexical integration this is what kind of decides how you have uh, comprehended a particular word. Now uh, one of the things uh, there uh, uh, you know uh, with respect to the mental lexicon is uh, and that people may ask is how is this mental lexicon organized? There are so many words a typical person might have a vocabulary of around 40 to 50,000 words and how are these 50,000 words organized? You know you might have gone, uh, gone uh, to a pharmacy store and you might have, might have seen that you know people organize uh, the medicines in such a way that uh, whatever medicine you say the person will go uh, in a minute or two pick up the exact medicine from the place that he knew the medicine was and will come back and say Achha, this is the medicine that you asked for. Uh, with respect to the mental lexicon uh, the question can be asked that we know so many words we use so many words on the daily basis how is information organized? There are multiple principles that have been suggested we will uh, take a look at some of them today. Uh, the first principle or the more basic general sort of a principle is the principle of frequency. One of the basic organizing principles in the mental lexicon is the frequency principle 
that says that the words that are higher in frequency will be easier to recognize than words with lower frequency. So suppose if there is a threshold or suppose if there is a you know a bin, a box or anything, the words with highest frequency will be at the top and most easily accessible and hence will show the lowest reaction times. People will be fastest in recognizing these words. This is again one very broad and generic principle. The other principle is morphology. Now we have talked about uh, morphological organization of words uh, in the Forbes model, if you remember the frequency ordered bin search model. Now uh, in the Forbes model what was there, the uh, words were organized according to their root uh, words. So there are many words which have uh, uh, one morpheme and there are many words which have more than one morpheme. And the words with more than one morpheme usually have a root word or uh, on to which the suffix or prefix has added. Okay, so uh, one of the things that is uh, one of the principles that uh, could be used to organize words in the mental lexicon could be according to root words. Okay, so uh, you know of uh, you, uh, you know of free morpheme, bound morpheme, and so on. Suppose there is this word called player. Play is the free morpheme, and play is the root word to which er is added, or ed can be added, or ing can be added. A uh, good way to organize the word is that you uh, you know create a bin, and the bin is labeled with the word play and all the derivatives of play are in there organized by frequency. At the top still the word play will be there because it has the highest root frequency, we have talked about that in the past and every other word basically uh, will be uh, lower than uh, play, uh, all of them will have their different surface frequencies. Okay. So that is one way in which uh, also the lexicon can be organized. The, uh, the third way that we can talk about is also by virtue of neighborhood. What is neighborhood? If you take a word and you can change one letter or one sound of the word and create another word, do it as many times as possible. So suppose say for example there is this word called cat, I, I will try and change a sound and create more words, so cat, bat, rat, mat, hat, all of these are supposed to be neighbors of each other because just by changing one sound you can create so many of the different words. Also uh, words may have many neighbors and words may have fewer neighbors. Say for example, if you take the word besiege for that, for that matter, okay, uh, what sound will you change uh, to create what word? It is very difficult to do that but you can kind of do that exercise later and you will figure out that there are very few words that can be made after changing an one or two or three sounds in besiege. Typically we just talk about changing one sound and creating another word. So there could be words like besieged. Uh, wherein uh, you know they have very few neighbors if any and then you have a word like cat or bat which have so many neighbors uh, just after changing one sound you can create so many words. So this is high neighborhood size, this is low neighborhood size and one of the proposals is that words with higher neighbors are organized differently than words with lower neighbors. This is also consistent with a lot of behavioral studies which have shown that words with many uh, neighbors are recognized slower than words with fewer neighbors. We are not talking of the lexical decision task, we are talking about a general task when you have to recognize a particular word. Okay. So these three are the principles by which how the mental lexicon, uh, using which the mental lexicon may be organized. Also the mental lexicon can use a semantic organization. Basically uh, I have so many words, uh, all three of these, these things that we talked about were properties and characteristics. So frequency is a characteristic of a word, neighborhood is a characteristic of a word, morphology is also a characteristic of a word in terms of how the word is composed. Now uh, there could be other characteristics as well, semantics is one very important category. Uh, semantics has to do with the meaning, what is the meaning of the word and can we organize the mental lexicon just according to meaning. So words uh, in that sense it has been proposed that words uh, that are semantically related may be connected to each other strongly. So for example cat, bat, rat, cat, uh, cat and uh, rat uh, and let us say dog are uh, probably semantically related to each other because they share so many features. They are all animals, mammals and pet animals in some sense. Uh, rats mostly uh, you know lab, uh, labs uh, do like to keep uh, rats. So in, in that sense they are semantically very similar as well and because they are semantically very similar it is a probability that in the mental lexicon they will be close to each other. 
Also because say for example, uh, you know when you men try and mention uh, rat, you probably also mention cat and when you are trying to mention dog, you might also again mention cat. So those kind of things have also been seen. So the proposal is that uh, the mental lexicon might also be organized according to the meaning of these words. Now uh, there has been a lot of evidence for uh, this kind of organization uh, actually being there in terms of and this evidence mainly comes from a lot of priming studies. So we talked about uh, the priming paradigm, so there is a prime and there is a target and when you present the prime for a very short duration, uh, you know 50 milliseconds, 70 milliseconds the prime comes and goes, then you present the target for let us say 250, 500 milliseconds and you ask the person to recognize the target. You say whether it is a word or a non-word or whether it is that specific word, whatever you might want to do. People have observed, again I am kind of again, revising the priming paradigm, is that depending upon the relationship that this prime had with this target, the target might be facilitated or inhibited as opposed to if there were no prime behind this particular target. Suppose you are just presenting targets in isolation versus you present, say for example you present a target word in isolation, you have got 400 milliseconds reaction time, then you present a semantically related target and then you get the reaction time of 350 milliseconds. The 50 millisecond difference is called the priming effect, it is called the effect of the prime. So depending upon the kind of relationships the prime and the target have, they might have semantic relationship, orthographic relationship, morphological, phonological, all kinds of relationships are possible. This basically says uh, that uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, you know that, they, that the priming effect is there. Uh, coming back to what I was talking about here is that if the prime and the target are semantically related, it is highly likely that the prime will uh, facilitate the recognition of the target. That can act as an evidence of the fact saying that maybe the mental lexicon is organized according to the semantics, that is the idea. Now there have been again as I was saying several models of the mental lexicon, one of them, uh, one of the more famous ones is the semantic networks model proposed by Collins and Loftus in 1975. I uh, will show you the uh, network already, uh, we have talked about the semantic networks uh, model in, in a lot of detail in the chapter on words, here you can see that you know words uh, that are uh, closer in meaning are uh, uh, you know bunched together as a cluster, uh, they are also connected to each other by these links, so the words are represented as nodes, the connections between them as links and you can see say for example apple, pear and cherry, uh, sunset, sunrise and clouds and say for example fire and uh, you know heat, they are all uh, you know put close together, connected very strongly together by the virtue of uh, meaning. So, for example, uh, yeah, uh, in, in this network words uh, that are closer together in say for example, car and truck are uh, close together as compared to the words that are not uh, you know related to each other. So, for example, car and clouds is, is not really very related to each other. So, that is that's not the connection is not there so much. Also say for example, semantically related words are uh, colored in uh, similarly, uh, but say for example, the words that are not colored similarly are. Uh, joined in terms of association, say fire truck is associated with fire even though the fire truck does not, you know, so it is it's meaning wise uh, uh, not so strongly related as, with, as uh, you know, uh, as association wise, whenever you think of fire, uh, you might also think of fire truck because the fire truck is used to extinguish fire. Okay, uh, red and uh, you know uh, fire truck are also related because typically that is the color in which fire truck is there, semantically there might be not so much uh, relationship. So uh, this is uh, just an example of uh, the semantic networks uh, model and the semantic networks model is basically something that says okay, the mental lexicon is recognized according to meaning, this is the figure you can see this is exactly how the organization is there. Okay, one of the principles if you remember here is the spreading activation principle. If you, uh, if you activate or recall or cue any of these words, uh, all those uh, words which are connected so closely to a particular word will get the benefit of that activation. Suppose you uh, mention red, orange, green and yellow and uh, rose for example and apple and cherry for example uh, and fire truck for example are all getting activated. Okay. Things that are closer to red, say for example orange, uh, green and yellow because they are all colors semantically also very uh, much similar will uh, get uh, activated let us say slightly more strongly as compared to things that are slightly further off. Say for example uh, between red and fire truck and truck, 
okay. So uh, obviously truck might also get some activation because it is connected to fire truck but by that time the activation would have diminished quite a lot. Okay. So this was one uh, uh, way uh, in which we had uh, talked about the organization of the mental lexicon. Uh, other alternatives have also been present. Uh, say for example, you know, word, uh, uh, you know, we've talked about the HAL and LSA kind of models. How that, how words are uh, linked to each other by virtue of association. We've talked about that as well. Uh, these questions are, uh, you know, uh, at the moment also being examined in some detail and there is a lot of research going on uh, in this by a lot of researchers. Now, let us talk about the, uh, you know, neural substrates of the mental lexicon. So, uh, we have kind of revised, brushed up our knowledge on the mental lexicon. Let us look at the neural substrates. I am sure yeah, we have done this part also a little bit. Now, it has been observed that people who have different kinds of neurological problems can provide clues to understanding, you know, what the different aspects of production and comprehension of concepts could be about. Uh, one of the very interesting group of patients is patients who have, uh, you know, a, a particular disorder called semantic paraphasia. Uh, the problem uh, with semantic paraphasics is that sometimes if you ask them to elicit a word, they uh, will intend to say something, but they will probably uh, say, uh, you know, elicit a word that is a close semantic relative of the intended word. Say for example, people can, uh, you know, if they intend to say cat, they might end up saying rat or dog. Okay. So, this is basically people who have uh, semantic paraphasia. Semantic paraphasia is a symptom in a disease called para uh, Wernicke's aphasia as well. We will talk about aphasia probably by the end of this chapter. Now, uh, similar errors uh, also are uh, made by uh, patients who have deep dyslexia, who have semantic uh, troubles in uh, you know taking uh, this reading instead. So, while reading, they end up reading semantically related words. Uh, cat is written and say for example, they have written cat chase the mice. Uh, the deep dyslexic might read it as the dog chase the mice because that, that confusion might be possible. Now, uh, another kind of patients uh, we can talk about is the patients who suffer with progressive semantic dementia. Uh, people with progressive semantic dementia show some uh, conceptual impairments, uh, but some other systems are alright. Say for example, while these patients will be able to understand and produce the syntactic structure of sentences, they might make, uh, you know, semantic or meaning uh, related errors. It has also been found that uh, this is basically uh, left, uh, you know, this is basically linked with increasing damage to the left temporal lobes, but we will come to that, okay. Uh, so, people with uh, semantic uh, dementia, uh, left temporal lobes are uh, sort of damaged and superior temporal lobes are preserved. Now, before we start talking about the brain, uh, let me and before we start talk, uh, using a lot of that jargon. Uh, I would like to give you a very brief account of a very rough account of what the brain looks like and what are these different uh, terminologies about. Now, if you look at the brain and I am not really very good at uh, drawing this, uh, let us say the brain looks like this. Uh, this part is roughly we will call it the frontal lobe. So, let us say this is the frontal lobe. This part here again slightly roughly, uh, this is the occipital lobe. So, let us call it occipital lobe. Then you have this lobe here, which is called the temporal lobe. And then this part here is basically your parietal lobe. As the brain is, these different lobes very broadly and I have given you a very, very rough description of this. These different lobes uh, are engaged in broadly different kinds of activities. Uh, the occipital lobe usually, uh, I mean the occipital lobe receives uh, and processes visual input. So, the input basically the eyes uh, will be somewhere here and uh, whatever the input comes from the eyes is processed here. Uh, the temporal lobe here basically has uh, what is called, uh, it processes the auditory or acoustic stimuli. Uh, the frontal lobe is mostly uh, involved in say for example, you know, reasoning, decision making, uh, you know, response selection, uh, inhibition say for example, maintaining civil behavior, deciding a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, parts of memory also uh, are there. So, the frontal lobe kind of does that. The parietal lobe is mostly in, uh, you know, 
uh, producing say for example synthesizing sensory input uh, integrating sensory input uh, also say for example uh, you know there are different theories I am not really going to talk about the entire uh, you know uh, section on what area of the brain uh, does what here but I am just giving you a very brief idea so parietal lobe kind of does uh, have this somatory, uh, somatosensory association cortices uh, they uh, uh, link uh, st uh, you know uh, stimulation together and they also have it also process about uh, you know uh, spatial locations and those kind of information so broadly this is how the uh, the brain's organization looks like say for example if i uh, so you will hear this uh, more and more in this week so the frontal lobe whenever i say frontal uh, whenever i say temporal i'm talking about this area whenever i say occipital i'm talking about this area so this is occipital this is temporal this is the frontal and this is the parietal so whenever you listen to this when you say when you hear frontal lobe this is the area that is in question whenever you hear occipital lobe this is the area in question temporal lobe this is the area and parietal lobe this is the area so again you have to kind of uh, you know kind of catch up with this and remember what uh, these different areas are about and then uh, one of the uh, one of the things that you'll also listen to uh, a lot is Uh, terms related to areas in the brain so when you're talking about anterior you're talking about say for example things in the front of the brain okay not really actually in the front but to any location so usually you'll see anterior temporal lobe so anterior temporal lobe means let us say if this is broadly the temporal lobe anterior temporal lobe means the area in the front of the temporal lobe. So, this is let us say anterior temporal ok and posterior basically means at the back. So, if you are talking about here this is posterior. So, anterior means in front of something, posterior means at the back of something. Now, you will also hear of inferior and superior. If you hear of inferior you are talking about areas towards the bottom. So, inferior temporal lobe is basically this area, it is posterior inferior you can hear. Say for inferior frontal cortex is this, this area here, the bottom of the frontal cortex. So, you know this is the inferior uh, frontal cortex. Also, you will hear of superior. So, superior is the top of something. Say for example, you can have you know uh, there are also uh, or other organization principles like uh, say for example in the brain uh, there are say for example you know there are uh, these different kinds of uh, ridges so there is this uh, you know uh, and there are ridges and, uh, and now I am kind of uh, slightly just giving you an example so uh, do not take this as uh, factual. Uh, but say for example, there are different kinds of structures in the brain and these uh, 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 slightly lifted up structure the tissue uh, basically are called uh, gyri, singular is gyrus and then there are these uh, ridges in the brain as well, deep uh, you know folds, uh, these are referred to as sulci or the singular is sulcus. So, uh, there is, I uh, will show you some figures where all of this uh, will be clear as well. So, uh, when I am talking about superior te uh, temporal gyrus, I am talking about the gyrus which is somewhere in the temporal area and we are talking about the top of that gyrus. Inferior frontal gyrus, if there is a gyrus, let us say here, inferior frontal gyrus is the bottom of that gyrus. Okay, so superior frontal, and there then you will also hear of middle temporal, medial. So there are also multiple views of the brain. There can be a top view, which is uh, you know the, there there can be a dorsal view, a lateral view, a medial view. Say for for example, uh, you might know that the brain has two hemispheres. If you cut the brain from the middle and you open it, there's the medial view. Uh, there is a sagittal and dorsal and all of that but I'm not going to confuse with all of this uh, I'm just giving you a brief idea of what each of these things mean 
and now when you listen to uh, me using those terms you have to kind of tell your brain okay this is what uh, uh, you know this person is referring to more often than not i will also show you the figures which will be uh, you know a, a good idea uh, to kind of a good reference point to look at those areas so that is that uh, let us let us come back to the stuff here i hope this was uh, you know useful uh, at least now what was I saying? I was saying that, say, for example, people who have progressive semantic uh, dementia, uh, semantic basically uh, will show some conceptual uh, impairments. Now, progressive means uh, dementia with respect to meaning, which is progressive, you know, which is increasing probably. Okay, so while these kind of patients can understand and produce the syntactic structure of sentences, they might make semantic errors, they might make meaning related errors. And what has been observed is that uh, these people uh, uh, are basically, the, uh, you know, the, the damage uh, or to the brain in these people is basically uh, there in the left temporal lobes, so left side and temporal lobes. While superior temporal lobes, the top of those uh, temporal lobes are preserved. Okay. Uh, patients with semantic deficiency, uh, semantic de uh, dementias uh, usually have difficulty in uh, semantic categorization of objects. So, they cannot tell you whether something is an animal or a uh, plant, uh, so to speak. Uh, they also sometimes um, end up producing exemplars from a different category than it. So, you ask them the name of an animal, they might give you a name of a bird. Okay, they are not really uh, very good at making these distinctions, you know, because of the lesion in the brain. Evidence from uh, various uh, research, a lot of studies basically provides therefore some support for the semantic network idea because what happens is if you are looking at these patients, if you are looking at the profiles and the symptoms that these patients go through and you, you know, there is a lot of assessment, a lot of tests given to these patients, what is usually being observed is that uh, words that are related in meaning have the potential to be uh, at times be substituted, confused with each other, merged with each other. And this is in some sense consistent with the prediction of the semantic networks idea. The semantic networks idea was saying that, okay, uh, you know, uh, things that are close to each other will, uh, you know, uh, get, say for example, the activation. So, if this word is activated and the word, this word is you're very close, uh, you might mistake the two, okay, that kind of thing. Now, a lot of research on this topic by Warrington and colleagues has suggested that patient problems with respect to category specific agnosias or semantic, uh, you know, uh, deficits which are category specific or category specific semantic deficits, whatever, uh, reflect different kinds of information uh, about different kinds of words. So, it basically tells for different kinds of categories, we store different kinds of information. The exact prediction is that biological categories, uh, living things that is, identify more on physical features. So, if you are talking about biological categories, you are going to talk more about physical features uh, and man-made objects are more uh, recognized by functional features. So, that is the idea. Consequently, many correspondences, uh, you know, uh, across most, a lot of research, uh, uh, you know, consequently, uh, a lot of correspondences or links, uh, you know, associations have been found between the lesion sites and the types of semantic deficits that people experience. We've talked about this in the past. Uh, say, for example, people uh, having impairment for living things showed lesion including the inferior and the medial temporal cortex, so uh, bottom of the uh, temporal cortex and the middle part of it and often mostly in the anterior region. So, inferior and middle in the anterior region. So, for example, if I have to uh, draw this uh, region for you, if I am saying this is the temporal cortex, uh, I am talking about anterior, so in the front and inferior on the bottom. So, this is the uh, anterior region of the uh, inferior uh, temporal cortex. So, this is the region I am referring to. This is just an example to show you how this uh, actually works. Uh, although exactly, uh, so this is basically uh, there. So, patients with uh, impairments for living things uh, usually have showed lesion for inferior and medial temporal cortex, often mostly in the anterior regions, that is in the front. These areas have usually been found to be uh, associated with visual object perception you know, analyzing the features of the objects, that is how you perceive and recognize objects. This is basically uh, also the what stream. So, uh, some scientists have uh, distinguished between the what stream and the how stream and the uh, what stream and the where stream. This is also part uh, participating in the what stream, okay. 
Although exact lesion sites, however, are not really known for people who have deficits for man-made objects, but uh, usually lesions for these people have been found in the left frontal and parietal areas. So, left frontal and parietal areas basically for functional features. It seems that the pattern of lesions and their correspondences with semantic deficits support the idea that has been put forward by Warrington and colleagues. So, that is that is what they have said. Now, this proposal had also been uh, put forward and been tested by various researchers. Say, for example, Farah and McClelland, uh, they tested this hypothesis by devising a computational model and the computational model kind of showed exactly, uh, uh, you know, results that were confirming the Warrington and colleagues hypothesis. Alfonso Caramaza also, uh, you know, proposed that uh, you know, Alfonso Caramaza kind of uh, tried to replicate it and, you know, uh, uh, did not really see uh, that this will happen and he criticized this and he said that uh, a lot of the studies till this point, 1998, uh, using these, uh, you know, uh, uh, semantic uh, deficits and explaining those uh, uh, symptoms have, did not really have a lot of controlled materials. Now, what happens in experiments? Uh, is that if you have to categorize particular objects, you have to categorize them according to very specific uh, protocols. Uh, and say for example, if you are using multiple stimuli, those should be matched on everything, uh, all the possible features, just the critical experimental feature is the one that has to be manipulated. So, Karamaza said that a lot of stimuli that were being used in these kind of studies were not very well controlled. They were not matched on things like visual complexity, they were not matched on things like visual similarity, frequency of use and so on. And that is why he said that it is probably not uh, correct to draw a very definitive conclusion on the basis of the studies done so far. Instead, he proposed an alternative theory and he said that according to, you know, he said that basically the deficits that are being observed are probably being observed not really because of the class of the object, but the characteristic of the object and the, one of the characteristics that he said was very important was animacy, if something is alive, moves or not, you know, animacy. And the proposition is that selective damage that is uh, basically observed in the Warrington and colleagues uh, patients, uh, you know, in, in the studies there are basically reflecting evolutionarily adapted domain specific knowledge systems that are subserved by dis, uh, distinct neural mechanisms. So, they say by evolution, we are uh, wired to uh, look at certain things in a particular way using a particular set of brain areas and that is what is being shown in these st studies. Now, uh, even after Karamaza, a lot of research has gone into, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, question as to uh, whether uh, the brain is uh, the organizing principle for meanings or concepts in the brain is biological categories and man-made categories or say for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, tools and uh, houses and so on. So, a lot of research has gone in. Uh, some of the research is done by Alex Martin and colleagues. Alex Martin and colleagues in 1996, they used PET and fMRI and they found that when participants were asked to name pictures about living things, the more lateral aspects of the fusiform gyrus, that is the area in the brain uh, near the temporal and uh, occipital lobe, the uh, fusiform gyrus and the superior temporal sulcus. So, uh, uh, you know, a, a particular sulci uh, at the top uh, of the temporal area were activated. When participants were uh, naming uh, objects or identifying tools, uh, more activation was observed in the medial regions in the fusiform gyrus, the left middle temporal gyrus and the left premotor area. Okay. So, these were the areas which are showing activation. So, these are different set of areas showing activation for uh, naming tools or other objects. A different set of areas is showing activation when you are naming uh, pictures about living things. Now, these findings again were found to be generally consistent with the animal uh, perceptual versus man-made functional hypothesis. The Warrington said that animals are recognized by perceptual features, man-made objects are recognized by functional features. Finally, uh, kind of you know the research investigating conceptual representation in the brain was also carried by Tyler and colleagues as recently as 2011. And in their study, what happened was they asked participants to name the pictures of living things like tiger and non-living objects like knife and also at the level. So, they also manipulated the level at this was at which this was named. So, you can name at a, you know, slightly broader level as in, uh, you know, living hair and non-living hair or you can also ask a very domain specific name. What is the exact name of this object? You could look at a picture, say living, non-living. You could look at a picture and say the exact name of that object. So, they manipulated the level of naming and they manipulated the category of uh, the stimuli that were to be named and they reported that uh, patients with lesions to the anterior temporal lobes could not name living things 
at uh, the specific level indicating that retrieval of specific and detailed information was impaired not and the deficit was across I think uh, across both kinds of stimuli. So, the conclusion that they made was that retrieval of specific and detailed information was impaired when in uh, you know when people are uh, experiencing difficulties with respect to naming living things. Similar results were found in the fMRI uh, you know uh, task as well. Now, this is sort of very similar to if you remember we had this discussion uh, in the word processing chapter we said that say for example, there are correlated features and distinctive features uh, animals or man made things does not really matter as long as you are talking about distinctive features a particular region of the brain will get activated as long as you are talking about correlated features a particular area uh, of the brain is going to be get activated and again by a particular media area I still mean a distribution of particular areas. This is precisely what you can also sort of conclude from this bunch of studies and uh, uh, this is basically what uh, we will stop at in terms of you know how word meaning is stored in the brain. I hope a little bit of revision of what we have done earlier and some of the added idea about which areas the brain are uh, used uh, might have helped. Uh, we will talk about uh, a different aspect of uh, the language in the next class. Thank you. Okay.